This is episode six of Eco Gorillas, written and read by Scott A. J. Johnson. For more information, visit ecogorillas.com. That's gorilla with two R's and two L's. To support this project and get early access to all the chapters, head over to patreon.com slash sajjohnson. If you've gotten this far, I hope you're enjoying it. So take a minute to tell a friend. If you've already done that, please consider leaving this podcast a review on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever you listen. And thanks. This podcast contains explicit fleeting language. Nope. This podcast contains fleeting explicit language. Chapter 13. Email Exchange. Fall 2014. To John Jacob. Editor at Primitivism.org From Eric Jensen E-A-J Jensen at email.com Date, 9 September 2014 8.38am Subject, Anarcho-Primitivism Dear Mr. Jacob, I enjoyed reading your most recent edition of The Primitivist. Really, I look forward to each issue and the thought-provoking essays that you have gathered. The reason I am writing, however, is to question the underlying premise of your journal. I am not doing this to be antagonistic or to try and refute your point of view. In fact, I'm hoping to better understand and refine my own understanding of human society and its future. When I first started down my path of exploration, I was drawn to anarcho-primitivism for many reasons. Most of them deal with the ills of industrial life, like social division, poor nutrition, unsustainable economic systems, and runaway population growth, and so on. The more I learn about societies across the world and the challenges facing humans and other species in the coming decades, however, the more I worry that anarcho-primitivism is not a viable way forward without significant changes. If you are amenable to an exchange of emails and ideas, I would like to lay out my arguments for and against anarcho-primitivism. Perhaps you can set me right and persuade me that anarcho-primitivism is in fact going to be humankind's saving grace. It is entirely possible I missed a linchpin in the anarcho-primitivist argument. Thank you, and I look forward to hearing back from you. Cordially, Eric Jensen. To Eric Jensen, from John Jacob, 10 September, 2014, 9.12 a.m. Subject, anarcho-primitivism. Dear Dr. Jensen, please call me John. Thank you for the kind words about the journal. I'll pass your sentiments on to the group here. I'd be happy to discuss anarcho-primitivism with you via email, with the caveat that I am just one person, with my own perspective on the concept. Others might see it differently. Someone else might be able to change your mind where I would fail, but I am intrigued by the request. Just to be sure we're on the same page, I'd like to mention a few baseline facts about anarcho-primitivism as I see it. I imagine we'll agree on these facts, but it is the interpretation where we will differ. First, at its heart, anarcho-primitivism is a reaction to the idea of civilization. I don't know what branch of social sciences you study, but in anthropology, the term civilization has fallen out of favor because it is inherently ethnocentric. We rely heavily on anthropology and archaeology to help us better understand the quote-unquote uncivilized life. Second, Most anarcho-primitivists trace the origin of most of today's problems back to the beginning of agriculture approximately 10,000 years ago. Every one of the following problems stems from the adoption of a sedentary agricultural way of life. Many of us see this as the imposition of humanity's totalitarian control of nature. It is the beginning of the idea that we are separate from the natural world and that we are somehow the overlords. Third, while anarcho-primitivists accept most scientific findings, we reject the idea of dogma, which is what most science has become today. Science has become the handmaiden of industrial civilization, reinforcing the perception that this way of life is inevitable and benevolent. Science should be a skeptical discipline. Science has enabled technology to run amok. Technology has in turn enabled and exacerbated the problems enumerated below. Fourth, the industrial and capitalist revolutions have supercharged the trends beginning with the adoption of agriculture. The problems listed below were made more severe as humans gained the ability to streamline agriculture and commodity productions through industrial means. They further separated the acts of subsistence from our day-to-day lives. Furthermore, the industrial capitalist worldview requires infinite resources and provides no outlet for its waste products. It actively encourages overconsumption and a culture of disposable products. Problem 1. Poor health. Only recently have we reached the physical stature of hunter-gatherer societies. That is, only in modern times have people been as tall and healthy as they were before 10,000 years ago. Additionally, we have just started to have life expectancies exceeding that of hunter-gatherers. The main culprit is a sedentary agricultural subsistence because when people settled down into a permanent location, they fouled their environments and depended on just a few domesticated species. Today, we see poor health in a world of abundance. Most Americans die due to lifestyle diseases. Problem 2. Violence. As people lived in one place, they could accumulate more stuff. They built infrastructure to grow and store their staples as well as protect their new possessions. In a bad year, some people were left with less than others. Eventually, some people would have been hungry enough to take their neighbor's good by force. 
In other instances, a particularly lucky family might have gathered enough influence to organize the forceful domination of their neighbors. Before sedentary agricultural existed, conflict was limited by small populations and their mobility. Only a few people were available to fight, and those who did not want to fight could just pull up sticks and leave. Today we see divisions along class, ethnic, gender, national, and other lines that often lead to conflict. Problem 3. Degradation. Since the beginning of agriculture, we have had a greater impact on our surroundings. First it was deforestation, silting of rivers, salinization of fields, and other localized problems. With the advent of a global, industrialized world, we now create global problems, such as climate change. These are facts born out of historical and archaeological data. The anarcho-primitivist point of view is that we can circumvent all these problems by pilling out the root cause, civilization. Hunting and gathering in small groups has been the dominant form of human society for millions of years. It is only our ethnocentric bias that makes us believe that this way of life is inferior to what we have gotten used to. I hope this brief synopsis is helpful. I imagine not all of it was new to you, but when framed in this way, I think anarcho-primitivism has a solid answer to the problems that we all agree are facing us. Sincerely, John. 2. John Jacob. From Eric Jensen. Date, 12 September, 2014, 3.15pm. Dear John, please call me Eric. Thank you for the summary, and you asked what branch of social sciences I study. I study anthropology and archaeology, so most of what you laid out was pretty familiar to me, but I appreciate the way you tied it together from the anarcho-primitivist point of view. It was certainly a good way to string those disparate facts together in a cogent argument. I agree with many of the points, but have a few clarification questions if you don't mind. I'll go point by point. Point one, civilization. Yep, we have shied away from this term in academic anthropology. I really like Ram Prior's idea of going beyond primitivism and civilization. You can find his blog posts on this here link, www.ranprior.com slash essays slash beyondciv.html. The most striking line goes something like this. If this life is hell and this life is civilized, then civilization is hell, and the opposite of civilization would be primitivism, and the opposite of hell is paradise, therefore primitivism is paradise. He rejects this conclusion and suggests a third way that is neither civilized nor primitive. Something else. Something new. While I agree that civilization is the cause of those problems, or at least the means by which those ills are perpetuated, I don't see that primitivism is the only answer. Why can we not take the useful lessons from primitivism and adapt them for our current world? Isn't it an anarcho-primitivist viewpoint that part of the problem with science is that it works under the assumption that a single truth is out there, and scientists are working to find it? In the same way, are not anarcho-primitivists being absolutists that the previous hunter-gatherer lifeways were the only way to live? One major problem with this idea is that hunter-gatherer societies have as many ways to subsist as there were groups. Anarcho-primitivists seem to read widely and cherry-pick the things that they like, while discarding the rest. Hunter-gatherers were successful because they were adapted to their place in society. If we try to recreate these societies elsewhere, or build a Frankenstein's monster of practices from all over, we might run the risk of picking up the wrong ones for our particular location. Point 2. Sedentary Agriculture I agree that the dawn of agriculture was a massive change in human society. Two caveats. First, it took place over thousands of years. It wasn't that people in the Fertile Crescent woke up one day and decided to become farmers, and you probably know this. Second, in tough times, people reverted to hunting and gathering. Hell, we see this today during times of economic or social distress. I hadn't seen domestication as the totalitarian imposition of human will over plants and animals, but I can see that point of view. In my opinion, I do see it more as a symbiosis. Some anthropologists have even argued that the plants and animals domesticated us. Those wily crops tricked us into protecting them from pests, and those clever goats got us to keep the wolves at bay. I think it's a cute idea, but I don't give the plants, animals, or even humans that much self-consciousness in the process. I think each actor went with the option that was the most expedient for it at the time. Even if it started as humans forcing their will on these early domesticates, the plants and animals quickly became dependent on the humans. Most domesticated species would not survive without us today, and in turn, such a large human population wouldn't make it without the use of the domesticates. I do think, though, that industrial agriculture and animal care is an abomination and cruel. I think we can find a happy middle ground where plants, animals, and humans are valued for their unique contributions to the ecosystem. Yes, some contribution might be corporal in the form of meat, but most domesticated animals are more useful alive. Point 3. Science and Technology I agree that scientific findings have become dogma and largely accepted on the basis of faith. Much of this stems, I think, from the fact that science has advanced to the point where a layperson cannot validate everything on his or her own. I'd like to call your attention to James Scott's idea of high modernism, which discusses the dogmatic belief in science, technology, and the industrial way of life. I really think you'd like it. 
Your comment reminds me of a line from the great documentary movie Jurassic Park, Har Har. Scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could that they didn't stop to think if they should. That's how I feel about a lot of our technology. Point four, industrial capitalism. One part of capitalism that I think is misunderstood is competition. It's commonly thought that capitalism is more efficient because it allows competition, but in some way this cannot be true. Think about smartphones. Both Samsung and Apple have hundreds of engineers, coders, and others working to design virtually identical products. Could they not more efficiently work together as a single team? All of the design problems would only have to be solved once. They're going over the same ground, so why not work together? Oh, right, money. Another aspect that is wasteful is neophilia, that is the constant desire for something new. And that seems endemic to capitalism. Our smartphone production teams waste so much time and effort making a new version of their product each year instead of a truly better product every five years. Capitalism encourages the throwaway culture you mentioned as well. We all know that they could have designed the first smartphones to be water and shockproof, as well as modular. That is, you could replace a weak battery, a broken screen, etc. with minimal effort. But they knew that a fragile, unfixable phone would generate more revenue because we're clumsy. Sorry, I got on a bit of a tirade there, but I want you to know that I do share your antipathy towards industrial capitalism and agree wholeheartedly that it has supercharged, as you say, the ills of sedentary society. I agree that something should be done about the industrial world, but I don't think it is to reject it out of hand and go back to an anarcho-primitivist state. The Luddites raged against the mechanized loom that put them out of work, not because they hated technology or a changing world, they hated how technology was changing their world in an unthinking way. The absolute destruction of mechanical know-how is just as bad as its want and application. The watchword in all of this is judicious. We should consider how changes affect people, especially those with a vested interest in that particular field. To go back to our smartphone example, we might say that beyond instant communication and access to social media sites where we can find an infinite number of cute cat videos, we each hold in our hand access to much of the world's knowledge. That's a powerful tool. On the other hand, if we look at the chain of production behind that immediacy, we start to question the efficacy of this tool. The production of a smartphone requires as many parts and materials, including cobalt, which is being mined by children in slave-like conditions according to Amnesty International. A few years ago, Apple was called to account for the working conditions in its Chinese factories. And these are just a few examples of the problems baked into the production of smartphones. If we think about the use of phones, then we get into the fossil fuel-dominated energy generation and the telecommunications infrastructure. In this case, we have to ask ourselves if it's worth child slave miners and factory workers in deplorable conditions to be able to access all of this information at the tip of our fingers. Perhaps if we had no alternative ways to access this information, it would be worth it. But we do have alternatives, so I would advocate for the information accessibility and communications and against smartphones as they currently exist. Problem 1. Poor health. The facts you mentioned about our poor health since the adoption of agriculture are right on. Think about it from a nutritional point of view. Hunter-gatherers ate dozens of species of plants and animals which provided them with a variety of vitamins, minerals, proteins, and so on, while the agriculturalists had a few staples. Also of note are the types of food eaten by the two groups. Hunter-gatherers concentrated on meats, roots, vegetables, fruits, and nuts. Sedentary agriculturalists depended on seeds, which require significant processing before being edible. For example, grinding wheat into flour and corn into cornmeal before soaking and baking to make bread and tortillas, respectively. No other primates are seed eaters. This dependence on fewer species also reduced the variety of nutrients available to farmers. As you said, only today have we regained our pre-agricultural stature, and that is likely due, in part, to the availability of diverse foods. Additionally, germ theory and the understanding of disease transmission has helped kids grow up healthy, which impacts their later stature, and also leads to explosive population growth, which is probably another issue we should discuss. Problem 2. Violence. With larger populations, violence was able to become impersonal, and I think this is an important distinction between pre- and post-agricultural societies. Before agriculture was widespread, violence was personal, if not directly. For example, my name is Indigo Montoya, you killed my father, prepare to die. Then, at least indirectly. For example, this is my traditional hunting range, I don't know who you are, but keep off. I'm in the firm belief, though, that violence is an innate impulse that can be curbed through learned behavior. Just like we learn to regulate our drives for eating, sex, and sleep based on social norms, we could cultivate a violence-free society. One problem endemic to the industrialized capitalist world is the emphasis on 
getting ahead of one's neighbors. That feeling that a person has no value unless he or she is on the cutting edge of material possessions, be they cars, clothes, gadgets, or housewares, is so deeply ingrained in our society that it seems to be an inborn trait. Primatological studies show that our nearest ape and monkey cousins do protest against unfair treatment. For example, the capuchin monkey who throws away an otherwise desirable bit of cucumber because his neighbor gets a yummier grape. If indeed we have a built-in fairness meter, we need to have social customs to regulate how it plays out in our society. Right now, it is used as a goad to drive people to work hard, earn money, and outcompete their neighbors. Hunter-gatherer societies often employ leveling mechanisms, which distribute windfalls to the entire community and have other mechanisms to engender equality and reduce social tension that might lead to violence. I think we can pull useful lessons from pre-industrial, agricultural, and industrial societies to build our new way forward. Problem 3. Degradation. As you say, the greater our ability to affect the world, the greater our ability to make a mess of things. If the modification of the landscape was the great ill that tipped the ecological balance in the agricultural revolution of 10,000 years ago, the use of fossil fuels is the scourge of the industrial age. Although you advocate getting rid of both agriculture and industry, I would advocate getting rid of drastic landscape modifications and fossil fuels, and then modifying agricultural and the production economy, in both cases this would mean scaling them way back. I think gardening and small-scale farming and careful consideration of local ecology are sustainable. In the same way, I don't see a problem with cottage industry industry production of items for trade, but this is just the opening salvo, I think. I appreciate you taking the time to respond to my email, and hope that we can continue to have a fruitful dialogue. All the best, Eric. To Eric Jensen, from John Jacob, date 15 September 2014, 1.12 a.m. Dear Eric, I enjoyed your email. In the interest of keeping things organized, I'll follow the points as you laid them out, too. 1. Civilization. I wasn't aware of Prior's piece. I read it, and I can see he makes a cogent argument. I also agree that anarcho-primitivists can be absolutists in their views, but I think it is from a well-informed absolutism. Think about it this way. Humans evolved for millions of years in small bands as hunter-gatherers. We have undergone radical social change in the last 10,000 years. And yes, while there might be a third way forward beyond the civilization-primitivism dichotomy, why bother reinventing the wheel? It would be a massive social experiment through trial and error to come up with a new way of living. We already have a well-documented system by which humans have lived for millennia. Of course, the subsistence practices would have to be adapted for each place, but as you say, we'd be able to pick and choose from a variety of solutions. Ancient hunter-gatherers didn't have the luxury of knowing about the many alternative practices. Although many lived well, they may have lived even better with a bit of cross-pollination of ideas. 2. Agriculture While your argument is logically well put, I think it stands on an unstable foundation, seed eating. You mention it in the health problem section. Our agricultural system is dependent on seeds. No other primate is a seed eater. Our bodies are not evolved for it. The reason we have to process seeds so much is to make them digestible. Doesn't it strike you as odd the lengths to which we have to go to eat wheat and other staple seeds? If you're interested, I recommend the book by Stephen Lindeberg called Food and Western Disease, Health and Nutrition from an Evolutionary Perspective. In short, he recommends against foods that were not commonly eaten in human evolutionary history, which coincidentally require significant preparation to be digestible, namely grains, dairy, refined fats, sugar, and beans. He recommends eating lean meat, fish, vegetables, fruit, root vegetables, water, and nuts. Agriculture focuses directly on those things that we are not evolved to consume. This doesn't even scratch the surface of what agriculture does to the ecosystem. Destroy biodiversity, increases topsoil erosion, depletes soil nutrients, and so on. I think we'll have to agree to disagree on calling domestication totalitarianism. Just because plants and animals now depend on humans for survival does not mean they like it or is in any way natural or justified. We've just taken away their natural defenses to keep them docile. Science and Tech I forgot about that line from Jurassic Park, but you're right. It never seems to be a question of should we develop some new technology, but rather if we can. With agriculture, I feel we've set a goal of most yield per acre measured in weight or volume, not in total nutritional value. For example, wheat today produces more per acre than a century ago, but it has less protein and nutritional value. So we've traded quality for quantity, which I think has become too common in our society. We would rather have more than better. This extends to everything. Cars, houses, clothes, technology, possessions, and food. 4. Industrial Capitalism No, no, rant away. I agree with you about the ills and contradictions of an economic system built on the children's game of King of the Hill. You can only win by pushing everyone else down. It brings out the worst in people. You talk about smartphones as an archetypal example of the system, and I think it's an apt one. One might argue that smartphones would be okay if they didn't have all the production issues you mention. It seems your only problem with smartphones is that they are produced in immoral ways. You laud the interconnectivity and access to information. I think the interconnectivity itself is a social ill. I hate to go back to the same well, 
but we evolved in small bands of a few dozen people at most. Our ancestral social networks extended to a few hundred people known through trading marriage partners between bands or seasonal gatherings. Neither our hardwired neurological capacities nor our learned social behavior has equipped us to live in such an interconnected world. We just cannot deal with so many connections. The sharing of knowledge is one thing, but living together in densely packed cities cheek by jowl with hundreds of strangers is a recipe for disaster, both in terms of social unrest and illness. The only way to salvage humanity is to get out of the cities that were made possible by industrialism. Sure, we had cities before, but without industrial manufacturing, they were neither as productive nor dense. Out. It all has to go. I think we are in agreement that health is an issue and much of it stems from our diet. We haven't really much mentioned lifestyle choices, sedentism, drinking, smoking, etc., but I imagine we are both in agreement that the portion of our society's obesity problem that is attributable to lack of exercise would be remedied in a non-industrial world, whether it's my anarcho primitivist state or your whatever you want to call it third way. Violence. I take your point about the difference between personal and impersonal violence. As you might have guessed, my small bands would lack impersonal violence as it was virtually unknown before the advent of agriculture. I think this point alone should be enough to convince you and others that anarcho-primitivism is a net benefit to society. I have read about leveling mechanisms before, and it is a practice that is so widespread in hunter-gatherer societies that I think it would be, have to be part of our way back. Again, I think we are in agreement. Violence is a problem that has been exacerbated in today's society, and fuel is heaped on the fire by a capitalist doggy dog system. I think we disagree about what the solution is, but to be honest, I really don't know for what type of system you're advocating. Perhaps you could lay it out for me in your next email. It would make it easier for me to frame my replies to your questions and comments. Problem 3. Degradation. Again, we agree in the problem but disagree in the solution. In this section, you started to lay out your position, small-scale gardening and agriculture with cottage industry. My problem with this is that you are still talking about a sedentary society which engenders violence and strife by its mere existence. We agree that the advent of agriculture and sedentism had many negative effects, so I do not understand why you want to cling to them in your own solution. In terms of environmental degradation, living in one place increases the concentration of problems on the landscape, erosion, human waste, and so on. I await your reply and look forward to learning more about what you think the real solution should be. But again, I say, why reinvent the world when we have a perfectly good one waiting in the forests? John. To John Jacob, from Eric Jensen. Date, 17 September, 2014, 9.15 a.m. Dear John, of course you're right that it's impossible for you to spar with an opponent you can't see. That is, without describing my solutions, I'm at an unfair advantage because I can poke holes in your firmly stated positions and you have nothing to poke back against. I'll do my best to lay out my proposal. Also, let's look at some practical implementation problems with anarcho-primitivism and why what I propose is a better alternative. 1. Civilization I think either one of our ideas would be a radical social experiment. It would be interesting to see how some of us in the highly industrialized world would fare when thrown back into a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. I agree that we may be having social trouble because of the impersonal and overlarge social networks we think we can maintain. I'd be interested in creating a series of human-scale villages across the landscape, as opposed to major population centers. In each area, which should be defined along physiographic borders, the community can decide how it would like to subsist, with the caveat that they must derive, use, and reintegrate all of their products from and within their own district. If one community wanted to subsist as hunter-gatherers, they could elect to do that. If others wanted to be intensive horticulturalists, that'd be their choice. The districts would be connected through a communication network. Neighboring districts would be expected to help one another in times of need and to share with their neighbors when they receive a windfall. In any case, each community would be its own experiment in sustainable living. Some strategies would be successful, while many would not. If your hunter-gatherer lifestyle was the most beneficial, perhaps it would become adopted across the world in a few generations, but it would allow for the possibility of other ways forward. I see one major problem with anarcho-primitivism. What to do with the more than 7 billion people on Earth today? Would you let billions die out until the population reach a reasonable level for the carrying capacity of the planet under hunter-gatherer subsistence, which is significantly fewer people per square mile than even subsistence horticulturalists? Would our transition be gradual with an active campaign to bring down the number of births across the world? Could not a smaller population exist in a balanced way with the ecosystem without being hunter-gatherers? In the third way I'm proposing, each district would be responsible for supporting its people within its own boundaries with an emphasis on education and gender equality. Across the world today, we see birth rates drop to replacement levels when women are well-educated and on more even footing with men. Over a few decades, a significant slowdown and even reversal of the exponential population growth would occur. Each community could decide how to best handle the question of population, with the successful plans being shared across the communication network and adopted by other districts who had less beneficial strategies. And a final question for you. If we become hunter-gatherers today, what should be done with the existing infrastructure? 
destroyed to discourage the readoption of sedentism, allowed to decay and collapse, potentially releasing harmful toxins into the environment. I'm thinking of industrial and nuclear facilities here. In my third way, we could use most of the existing infrastructure instead of wasting the time and effort that went into creating it. The idea of a throwaway culture extends to our current building mentality. Tear it down and build something else. With the end of an industrial, fossil fuel-driven world, we'd have to use the infrastructure we have and maintain what we want to keep, which is usually more efficient than building anew. 2. Agriculture. I see your point about us being outlier primates by eating seeds. I will note, though, that seeds have one great advantage. They store well. Most of the foods you mentioned, specifically the fish, lean meats, fruits, and vegetables, have short lives. Roots and nuts do a bit better, but nothing approaching the storage life of seeds. I do agree, though, that seeds might be used as a secondary source of food rather than a primary one. I also want to point out that not all agriculture is focused on growing seeds. Vegiculture is a subset of agriculture that encompasses root vegetables and others that are generally grown from cuttings for their plant meat rather than seeds. The potato, for example, was a staple of the Inca Empire with seeds, quinoa and later corn, as a supplement. Learning generally produces hard-to-transport foods such as vegetables and fruits that would fit well under the foods you recommend. Preparing food has predated our dependence on seeds. Perhaps you've heard of the expensive tissue hypothesis? In short, a primate's digestive tract is related to the foods it eats. Since most primates are vegetarians, they have large digestive systems to extract enough calories from the foods they eat. This requires a large amount of energy. Humans, on the other hand, have small digestive systems, and this frees up energy to run our ridiculously oversized brains. Part of the reason we can have the smaller system is that we eat nutrient-dense foods such as meats, nuts, and fruits. However, another concession to our digestive system is that we pre-digest foods by processing it. Grinding or cutting foods into a paste or smaller pieces increases the surface area. Additionally, fermentation and cooking break down complex molecules into ones that are easier to digest. So the fact that we prepare seeds for eating in and of itself does not mean that it's bad for us. But I do think that the more one must prepare a food stuff, the more likely it is to be a problem food. I would advocate for using the landscape as a managed mosaic. The best example of this is the eastern woodlands region of the United States. When the Europeans arrived, they thought they had happened upon virgin forests with a few Native American villages. In fact, they were looking at a carefully managed ecosystem, but they were unable to recognize it because, to them, management meant cleared and plowed fields separated by fences. A managed mosaic is a type of permaculture. Pockets of land will be managed differently. An open area might be, be a planted garden, nuts and fruit trees and forests might be protected, and wildfires would be allowed to fulfill their role in the ecosystem. Instead of imposing our will on the ecosystem, we would nudge it in the direction we want it to go, clearing a path of least resistance to a robust, diverse ecosystem that supports humans and animals and plants together. This fits with your correct observation that we have remove the natural defenses of domesticated plants and animals. I always like to say, we select it against the dangerous pointy bits on animals and the poisonous hard bits on plants. In a managed mosaic, plants and animals must fend more for themselves and would become more robust as the weaker members would be removed from the gene pool. Science and technology. Yes, I agree that today we trade quantity for quality, and yet we still have starving people across the world, not because we lack the food, but because they lack the money to buy the food from abroad. We should be ashamed. I would not advocate for ditching our science and tech, but rather rebuild it with a new set of ethics. Scientific ethics stem from our social mores. Since we have a no-hold-barred society where anything is for sale, the same is true in science. In a new society, one that is focused on the thoughtful application of human effort and fitting into the larger ecosystem, a new scientific ethic would emerge that would ask, should we, before, could we? As a recovering academic, one major problem I see with research today is it has gotten too tied to the university system. A half century ago, a high school diploma was needed to obtain a so-called good job, but today the bar has been raised to having an undergraduate degree. This has swelled the ranks of college-bound students. This is not a bad thing in and of itself, but most liberal arts students are in school not to get an education, but to receive a degree so that they can fall in today's so-called good jobs. Thus, students and professors work at cross-purposes. The former seek a degree, and the latter try to teach critical thinking, new ideas, and clear expression. Why waste everybody's time with things the students don't need or want to know? Perhaps we could bring back the cloistered monastery, not for religious monks, but for scholars doing research. And apprenticeships could follow a general education. In all cases, though, we should take a lesson from our distant ancestors and learn in small, interactive discussion groups rather than one-way lectures and lessons, where students are only rewarded for their rote memorization abilities. Industrial Capitalism it is a fair point, and without defining my position, I could see how you could think I was advocating for the continued use of cell phones. 
I generally ascribe to the doctrine of simplest means. What is the simplest means to achieve an end when all the facts are taken into account? For example, a microwave dinner may seem the simplest way to eat a meal, but if one considers the immense amount of agricultural work, food processing, continuous chain of refrigeration, production of microwaves, creation and waste of plastic containers, and healthcare costs of this diet, it isn't a simple meal at all. In that light, I would not advocate for the use of smartphones. We can achieve many of the same means through simpler methods. I would say that a handheld computer is not a bad idea and may provide some unique and worthy tasks, but for the most part, I think they are being wasted in this mass market. I do think that a well-connected global network is a net positive. What would that look like? Probably laptop-like computers, which use less power than desktops, with easily repaired modular components, for example, replacement parts my tech-phobic mother could install, and all this connected to a text-driven network, which would require a fraction of the bandwidth now thought to be necessary because of the video load on the internet. Current estimates put video streaming at 70% of the web's bandwidth. Perhaps we should import an idea from Cuba and have centralized locations with the video files available for transmission by flash drive. In Cuba, it's a black market, but imagine if your local library had a few terabytes of video, and all you had to do was stop by with a flash drive. Even the system would be problematic because producing LCD screens and microprocessors requires a fairly sophisticated production facility. Then again, I had a set of encyclopedias in my room growing up and spent plenty of time reading them. In any case, this network would have to be publicly accessible in each neighborhood at least. I'm not saying everything should or would look just like this, but it's hard to come up with an alternative solution if pressed. Problem one, poor health. Yes, diet and exercise seem to be major contributors to our health problems, including obesity. I'm not a medical doctor, but I've read up a bit on obesogens. You might have already heard about these artificial chemical compounds that have effects on the body, often mimicking hormones or other important chemicals. They may be a factor in obesity, as well as other health problems. As you say, people would suffer less from lifestyle maladies in either of our scenarios, but the incidence of other diseases might come back without vaccinations, such as polio or whooping cough. And medical screenings for cancers, although it's hard to say how much of the cancer epidemic is due to exposure to carcinogens and how much of that is evolution, does not select against most cancers because the sufferers have already passed through child-rearing ages. Anyway, without hospitals and our industrial medical system, we will lose people to accidents and other problems that are not always fatal today. On the other hand, the population in general may be much healthier as a whole. My proposal does not have a fully fleshed out medical plan, but I imagine something like the community doctor who can treat most day-to-day issues with regional surgeons who travel between communities. I'd have to talk to some MDs about what type of vaccinations and other things could be done outside of the industrial model. Problem two, violence. Again, we agree. So the question becomes, how do we prevent violence? I think an aggressive campaign, do you like that word choice, of cultural change could be undertaken, one that puts social stigma on those who are violent. In our current society, for example, we've decided that sex with children is one of the worst possible deeds, even though it was accepted practice in ancient Rome. It's clear that we can decide something is wrong and work to make it culturally unacceptable. Of course, in a pacifist society, a single person who is willing to use violence might try to take over. In my proposed villages, it is possible that one community decides to take over its neighbors for real or imagined slights. It may be possible to use social pressures, especially shunning, to defuse violent groups. For example, cut off communication and interaction with those problem groups. Problem three, degradation. I think you're making a false equivalence. Systemic violence is associated with sedentary agriculturists, therefore all sedentary agriculturalists have systemic violence. I think not. I think it is more likely because of the reasons laid out in previous emails, but not inevitable. Similarly, while environmental degradation has been associated with sedentary agriculturalists, not all sedentary agriculturalists degrade their environment. For example... Local-scale gardening and agriculture is less likely to cause problems. It would still have to be large enough to support a community, but using a managed mosaic and permaculture principles, it wouldn't be as hard on the ecosystem as current equivalents. On the contrary, in a managed mosaic, the environment is often enriched as humans can take an active role. For example, right now, we have many different colors of chickens. If we were to allow them to range more freely, chickens whose colors most closely match the surroundings would do better. Over time, predation would pick off the colors that stand out. We humans could hurry the process along by eating those with standout colors and only letting the others range freely, thus jumping over a dozen generations of natural selection. Another example, instead of letting goats overgraze an area, we could push them along and let an area regenerate faster. We can set out rules to guide our decisions. The chief among them should be natural mimicry. If our practice doesn't have a close parallel in nature, it should be avoided. I'm sorry for the overlong reply, but in order to start sketching out my third way, I needed a bit more space. 
Our group of friends and I regularly get together and talk about this sort of stuff. We've actually written a document that lays out the why, wherefore, and what's next for these ideas. Perhaps you'd be interested in coming for a visit. I think you'd really enjoy it, even if you're an outlier as a hunter-gatherer. But then again, each of us has an idea or two that is nearer to our hearts than it is for others. All the best, Eric. To Eric Jensen, from John Jacob. Date, 19 September 2014, 11.02 p.m. Dear Eric, I was all keyed up to respond to your email until I read the last paragraph. If you're at CSU, then I'll be in your area in a few weeks by complete coincidence. I'm going to a conference during the week, but have the weekend of October 25 and 26 free. Do you guys happen to be meeting then? John. To John Jacob, from Eric Jensen. 20 September, 2014, 7.15 a.m. Dear John, we meet up at the drop of a hat. I'll get in touch with the group over this week and confirm, but you can pencil it into your schedule. Do you know anyone in town? Do you have a place to stay? You'd be more than welcome in the guest room at my house as long as you're not allergic to dogs or my wife. I'll get back to you within a week with firm info, but I'm really looking forward to meeting you and continuing our conversation. I've been chatting about our correspondence with a few folks from my group, and I'm sure they'll be excited to pick your brain. More soon, Eric. End of chapter. End of episode 6 of Eco Gorillas. For more, visit ecogorillas.com.